Um, in just a minute or two, we can settle down. I'm going to close this. So uh, my name is uh, Ravi Bala, and um, we're here tonight to talk about the Rebuild by Design project. Uh, it's a comprehensive flood protection program. Before we go any further, I just want to acknowledge some of our elected officials who've joined us today for this workshop and discussion. We have uh, Council Member Jim Doyle here. We have Councilwoman Tiffany Fisher here. We have Council President Ruben Ramos here. I believe um, the Sixth Ward Councilwoman Jennifer Giatino is either here or on her way. Uh, and we may have other council members or um, we have school board members, Soboloff here, and we may have some others as well. I apologize if I, I left anyone out. Um, also want to thank uh, Caleb Stratton and uh, Jennifer Gonzalez, as well as Director Forbes, for their efforts. And uh, last but not least, all the partners we have, both public and private, with uh, HUD, the DEP, ACOM, and all the professionals. Um, this has been a, a truly collaborative effort so far. Uh, before I go further, I just want to acknowledge also the co-chairs of the Community Advisory Group. They are Councilman Jim Doyle and, um, and Michelle May. Is Michelle here? Here, here we go. So the, the Community Advisory Group, just so uh, everyone is aware, is a collection of citizens who have applied to serve um, in a volunteer basis to really um, dive a little bit deeper than the general public into the process, the Rebuild by Design process uh, from start to finish and offer um, insights that the professionals wouldn't otherwise have um, b being Hoboken local residents. Uh, I used to be co-chair of the, it's called the CAG, the Community Advisory Group. And from my experience serving along with um, Carter Kraft, uh, Latrenda Ross, uh, Councilwoman Fisher, is that the CAG, the Community Advisory Group, is really the eyes and ears on the ground. Um, their voice and your voice is critical to uh, be heard in order for the professionals, whether it's ACOM, um, the folks from the private sector, or the folks from the DEP, to really understand what's palatable, what's, what can be done, what can't be done from a local perspective. So even though people often say, does the mayor make a decision, or does the city council vote on this, or how, what's the process? The process is the citizens. It's, it's the CAG uh, making their voices heard. And what I've noticed is through that process, which started with five alternatives, was narrowed down to three alternatives, and eventually became what's called a preferred alternative. Um, if we didn't have the voice of the Hoboken, of Hoboken residents, uh, both through the community advisory group and generally, we wouldn't have come as far as we have today. So the input that we've had from uh, residents saying, you know, for example, the Garden Street option is ridiculous. We're not going to. That's that's not an option, um, or this option is um, is challenging for for another reason. That input has really informed where we are today and how we got to what's called the record of decision, which I believe was last uh, September or thereabouts, last fall. The record of decision is what triggered um, the funding mechanism, the $230 million that's being allocated to this project for what's now, uh, what I would say is the, the more exciting part, which is the design and construction phase um, that uh, we're gonna see between now and 2022. So that's where we were with respect to concepts and alternatives. Uh, where we are now is that the money from the federal government has been re released. It's being administered by the state of New Jersey in partnership with ACOM. And uh, we're going to go into the design and construction phases, which um, Adele is going to provide us more information about in a few minutes. So the format tonight is... Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, you're going to get a presentation on um, what the options are, where we are with the design phase, and then there are also um, workstations um, afterwards if you want to uh, provide specific input to the professionals, either verbally or with respect to um, the, the boards that are up there, there, you'll have that opportunity as well. So uh, before I hand the mic over to Adele, 
I want to uh, make sure I address one very important issue uh, with respect to the ultimate design of this project. That is what's called the southern alignment of the resist portion of uh, the rebuild by design project. So we have um, a, a re resist, delay, store, and discharge element. These are four different elements. The first element is resist, which is to really protect from coastal flooding. And on the southern portion of that resist element, which would protect us from the water we saw during Sandy coming in through the Long Slip Canal and the southern portion of Hoboken, there were two options that were proffered um, as possibilities in the final design and construction phase. Uh, one option, which is called option two, would have a um, flood protection um, mechanism or barrier that would run along Observer Highway right now, which would be anywhere from estimating eight to, 10, eight to, to 11 feet in height. Um, there's another option called option one, which would actually align itself a little bit further south uh, behind what's called the Hudson Rail Yards project um, redevelopment area. Um, and that's another possibility as well. Uh, there is some disagreement amongst uh, stakeholders as to what the pre preferred option is. The, the downside of having option two is that it would have a tremendous adverse impact on the ability to redevelop the Hudson Rail Yards and implement what's called the Hudson Rail, Rail Yards Redevelopment Plan, which was passed by the City Council in 2014. I've made my position known as Mayor of Hoboken that I strongly prefer a plan that can accommodate uh, the development that was contemplated in the 2014 Redevelopment Plan. Uh, first, because it would provide a tremendous economic boon to the state of New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey Transit has invested a lot of uh, time and money and stands to reap a lot of returns on investment to the tune of 28 to $30 million a year through that economic de development plan on the property that it owns. Uh, so there's a lot to be gained, uh, not necessarily by Hoboken residents, but statewide through an option that accommodates that development. Um, at the same time, uh, my primary role as mayor is to watch out for the health, welfare, and safety of Hoboken residents. And that's what Rebuild by Design is all about. That's a quarter billion dollars to provide comprehensive flood protection uh, to Hoboken residents. So I've made it clear to both the Department of Transportation, NJ Transit, and uh, the, the Department of Environmental Protection that Hoboken wants to be a partner in this process. My preference is, um, is an alternative that can both um, create the opportunity for not just for Hoboken, but for New Jersey to redevelop the Hudson Rail Yards, but also not sacrifice any portion of our timing, which is very tight with respect to um, uh, the southern alignment uh, of the resist portion. So I just wanna make sure that's clear. That's where we stand right now. I'm in discussions and trying to get updates from the state of New Jersey as to which option or whether a hybrid might be developed. What I'm told is that within the next 30 days or so, there will be a decision coming from Trenton from uh, the office of the governor as to you know, which direction uh, the state is gonna go in. My personal hope is, as our mayor is that um, under first and foremost, under no circumstances do we compromise the timeline for rebuild by design um, and make sure that we we stay on stay on time. Um, but at the same time, I am very sensitive to the 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 desire to try to have a win win and accommodate both both um, interests. So that's where we stand on that. Um, I've spoken a lot, so let me just uh, hand it over to Adele, and he'll um, start the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Bala. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here with you. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us, especially on a, uh, a weeknight and a school night for that. Um, 
It's really great for me to be back here. I've got a strong emotional connection to Hoboken in the early 80s. Uh, I went to school at Stevens Tech, taking courses at night so I can graduate on time. Gained a great appreciation for jazz by going to the Brass Rail and Maxwell's and, and learned how to eat a 36-ounce uh, steak from authors. Um, all things I would not recommend for anybody uh, today, but um, I also interned during the summer at Maxwell House in U.S. testing. Neither buildings are here today, but um, I bring my family off in, uh, in the weekends, and we still enjoy Hoboken uh, quite a bit. Uh, very happy to see it blossom uh, through the years into the great town that it is today. Uh, so my role as a facilitator, I really wear three hats. I'm a facilitator, an MC, and a, uh, an agenda gatekeeper. And my goal for the night uh, as a neutral third party is to just make sure we go through the content, make sure that all the speakers uh, stay on time, and make sure that we save enough time for the activity that we have uh, planned for you, um, as well as make sure that we've got time for you to interact with DEP separately <laughs> and ask all the questions uh, that you may have. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna quickly run through the agenda. Uh, we're gonna call uh, Dennis Weinecht from uh, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. He's a familiar face to many of you, and he's gonna provide an overview and accomplishments. It's been a while since the last meeting, so uh, he's got some uh, great accomplishments to share with you and level set, make sure that we're all on the uh, same page. And then I'm going to ask Chris Bonoski to come up and do the uh, design team introductions of AECOM. We have a great number of AECOM professionals here, and they're all eager to share with you some of their um, initial design thinking. Um, and then Karen Apple, uh, the, uh, the project manager for uh, the, resist by, uh, the uh, Rebuild by Design, is going to come up and do the review the purpose, the need, as well as go into some of the early observations um, in the, uh, as a result of the field investigations. Uh, and then she's going to call um, Eric Olson, who is going to go through some of the initial design principles um, and then uh, blend into how we're thinking about some of the urban uh, amenities are going to be woven into the urban environment. Uh, and then he's going to begin describing sort of the great activity that we have for you as a way to really enrich the entire experience for tonight. Um, and then we're going to break out. Um, then we're going to bring everybody back. And, um, and then we're going to adjourn. Hopefully, our goal is to get you out on time by 9 o'clock, uh, yield any more, any time left uh, for you to carry on your personal agenda. Um, Probably the biggest ground rule that I would say we need to keep on in mind and help me do my job as a facilitator is we need to stay on time. So we ask that you please hold all the questions to the end. We, are, we asked all the subject matter experts from DEP to stay behind so that they can answer all the questions that you might have. Um, so the last 20 minutes or so, or a half hour when you're doing the, uh, the activity, feel free to float between the activity as well as the DEP table and ask your questions. Uh, feel free to divide your time any way you want, but we made sure that DEP is available so that they can answer any questions. Really excited about this project, really excited about the amount of participation that we're seeing, and with that, let me introduce uh, Chris Bonoski. Dennis, sorry. <laughs> Hello, hello everyone. Hi guys. Um, I worked for the last year to get really good at PowerPoint and work the projector and do all this stuff because I wanted to be better for you guys. And then AECOM comes and changed the software. So I'm back with my pieces of paper that you know and love. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming this evening. Um, my boss, uh, Assistant Commissioner Rosenblatt, not be here. He asked if I'd come in his stead, and I'm really proud to do that. I think over the last three years, I think I've come to know most of you in the room. Um, how's that? Better? Okay. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Dennis Reinick. I'm the Bureau Chief of the Bureau of Flood Resilience. I'm running both RBD projects for the state. Um, but before I get started, this is really always a good test for us. We had this work really, is anybody coming to their first public meeting on this project, on the Rebuild by Design project? One, two, oh, excellent. This is really great. 
if I haven't, um, when you saw me on when I was wearing my jacket, if you didn't meet me then, at the end of the night, can you stop by? I'll get you a card. And then uh, in case you have any questions, you can always write me. All right. Um, let's see. Alexis, I think, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a, just a little background history. I think there's enough hands in here that really kind of uh, spend some time to reinforce what Mayor Bala said about, about the, the four-step strategy of this project. The U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development launched the Rebuild by Design competition after Hurricane Sandy. As part of this competition, the Hudson River, Hudson River Project vision was a four-part strategy. It was to resist the severe coastal water storms. It was addressing heavy rainfall events by delaying that water from entering the combined storm sewer system, storing rainfall where possible, and then ultimately discharging that water away from areas that flood. I think this vision works. Um, I think we spent the last two years working together to, to really make this vision a reality. And thanks to the good work of many people in this room, in June 2014, the Hudson River Project won an award of $230 million to fund the surge resist component of this strategy. So that's the top left-hand corner. Um, normally on projects of this size, the other three components would be left to gather dust. Um, but that's not happening here in Hoboken, Jersey City, and Weehawken. Ho Hoboken's taken up the mantle to start, start installing these delay store discharge components with us in our resist strategy. The Northwest Resiliency Park is currently under design. That construction's anticipated to start in 2019 and will store at least a million gallons of water below ground and potentially an additional one million gallons of green infrastructure above ground. Southwest Park opened in 2017 and stores 200,000 gallons of storm water and with a possible expansion could, could store an additional 600,000 gallons. Um, Jen, uh, Jen Gonzalez, your uh, chief sustainability officer for Hoboken, um, sent me these bullet points to show how working together this is going to be a spectacular project. Um, and Jen's offered tonight to uh, set up a table. I don't know, Jen, where did you set up your table? In the back? Um, in case you have any, any questions on those three initiatives that I just, just described. Okay. This one that you guys have all been coming, right? You've seen this slide a hundred times. But today it's really a, this slide is about an accomplishment. This is about accomplishment of activities and steps that we needed to accomplish in order to, to get the, our federal funding. Our federal funding required us to get on a, a specific process. Every one of those little check boxes at the top had to be ticked off in order to get our money, to get the money to build this project. We needed to follow the National Environmental Policy Act. We needed to run a feasibility assessment. You can see both of those blue lines. They've now reached and we finished those in 2017. But as we were doing that, we completed our um, environmental impact statement. Together we did that last summer. That led to a record of decision where we decided on the project in September of 2017. And then in October, HUD turned around and said, this is a great project. You're authorized to use your grant funds to begin construction. That was a huge milestone for this project and the first one of the RBDs to receive such authorization. Um, why am I spending time in the schedules? Because we did this together. Um, it was the people in this room, it was the engineering firms, it was the state, it was local government moving at a pace in order to really make this project real. And you also notice the engagement arrow at the bottom. It, um, it starts at the beginning, but if you notice, it doesn't have an end. Uh, that's because this communication that we're having tonight, we're gonna keep doing with AECOM now that they're on board. Go ahead, Alexis. Quickly, this is our next schedule. Um, we have five years. We're gonna complete our design by the end of next year and then move quickly into construction that needs to be completed by September 2022. Frank uh, Schwartz, the project manager, is hoping to have some sort of um, construction activity late next fall. Um, we're real excited to get started moving out of this feasibility phase and moving into real design, real construction. During the next, uh, during the design and even through into the construction phase, we're going to have to have many areas of uh, ongoing coordination. The executive steering committee um, 
Mayor Bala is now on that committee, uh, taking over from Mayor Zimmer. Uh, it's made up of DP, HUD, Hoboken, Weehawken, and Jersey City officials. We meet regularly as necessary, and as issues arise, we'll pick up the phone and make phone calls to each other. Um, we also have a community advisory group in each three communities, and Hoboken has just uh, reformed theirs, and uh, they're off and running. We're also, um, we have also started our operation and maintenance subcommittee where we're basically framing out what the O&M plan could look like. It's gonna take a while to put that together. It's got a lot of parts, um, but we're gonna reach out to every specialty, the county, um, CERT teams. We're gonna be reaching out to a whole bunch of community, um, police, fire, transit, to make sure that plan works and works well. Um, the urban design amenities program is gonna be an ongoing um, dialogue, and I think we're gonna start doing a little of that tonight, right, Karen? Good, good. And then this one always comes up, Section 106 Programmatic Agreement. What's that? That's an agreement that we think is really important to this community, especially um, the historic nature of Hoboken. This agreement is in place to preserve the historic nature of the area, and ongoing coordination will be required through the design and construction phases so that we protect your community as we build inside it. This slide I like. Um, because I think some of you uh, in the community that have been with us for the last three years um, have always known the schedule is tight, this, um, but we have a, an end game for the design phase to complete in 2019, and we are, while the schedule's tight, we're looking at the completion of sep September 2022 is still possible. Um, we're gonna be looking at that even throughout the design to find areas to save time and areas, uh, areas to work more efficiently. The budget, the budget was also a challenge. We all knew that. Um, so during the design phase, we're also gonna be looking at the budget to make sure that what we're designing is cost efficient and then what we're designing is necessary and what we're designing is, uh, has some value. Uh, value engineering is gonna be a huge component as we select materials and that type of thing. FEMA accreditation is gonna be a challenge. Um, we're gonna be working on that uh, throughout this design process and into construction. We have a large number of gates, and we have some subsurface conditions that we're still evaluating. Um, I'll skip over the southern alignment just for a second. Uh, and then the operation and maintenance, uh, obviously over the next 18 months, we're gonna have to basically develop uh, options to uh, have an entity to operate, how it will operate, integrate it into the plan, and really look at some long-term financing options. And lastly, but not least, the southern resist, uh, resist alignment. Uh, to Mayor Bala's point, a final decision has not been made. Um, we expect a final decision on the alignment likely within the next 30 days. DP continues to work with all partners to reach a resolution to the alignment while prioritizing our mission to deliver a comprehensive flood protection system by September 2022. New Jersey Transit will have to balance impacts to rail operation with either alignment as we move forward to that decision. Um, I think they're very consistent with what Mayor Bala spoke to before, and um, if you have further questions on that, I'll be available later in the evening. Okay. Um, what, did I have a next slide? Oh, I get to, all right, good. All right, so here's the, here's, the, here's the fun part. All right, I did all the history. You got to see the boring Dennis, okay? This is the fun Dennis. We've hired AECOM through a competitive bidding process to design this project. They're gonna hit it out of the park. They've put a team together that is gonna build, design us something spectacular that we can install and integrate into your community. And with that, if I haven't oversold you, Mr. Bonoski, here's the Vice President of AECOM. Thank you, Dennis. And uh, just on behalf of AECOM and our subconsultants and our team, we're just say we're really glad to be here. We're really looking forward to getting to start to work with you guys, working through the challenges on this project, and, and, and de like Dennis said, delivering this flood control project by September 2022. So I have the uh, distinct pleasure of being the project executive for this project, but also for the Rebuild by Design Meadowlands project. So I get to work with Dennis on both projects. Uh, I'm also the resident IT guy, if you didn't notice before, I'm trying to get things going here. But what that means is that we get to take advantage of the lessons learned on both projects, and specifically for Meadowlands and the, the work we've done with the state and with HUD and with FEMA, we can bring to bear on this project. 
Uh, you can see some of the subconsultants that we pulled together for this, this project. It, it, we thought it was important to continue the, um, the continuity of some of the, the important subconsultants that have worked from the, the initial project competition and through the early phases of design. So you'll notice OMA, who you've, you've met before, you've seen before, and uh, Royal Haskonian, DHV. So they're part of our team. They're going to be working through these uh, designs with us and working with you as well. So these are some of the uh, faces you'll see here tonight. Uh, as Adele said, Karen will be presenting, Eric will be presenting. Um, there's one change here. There, if you see Daniel down in the kind of middle right there, he couldn't make it. But we do have his twin brother, Danny. And Danny, if you could just, you just raise your hand, there's Danny. <laughs> so, so, these, so these guys are going to help facilitate. You'll see some, through some of the workshop. You'll be working with them over there. But I just want to make sure that you recognize Danny. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our project manager, Karen Apple, and she's going to start working you through the project. Thank you. All right, so um, ooh, I'm a little shorter. First of all, I want to say I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is my only project that I'm working on, and I'm also a Hoboken resident. Um, I've lived here for five years, and I just bought an apartment um, in the flood zone um, in, in October. So, yeah, okay? So I'm really, I'm in it. I'm in it with you guys. <laughs> this is not just my job. Um, and I care what it looks like and feels like. And, you know, I know the other parks and I know the one way in, of the street and which way that street goes and the neighborhoods. And so um, I, hope, uh, I hope that makes a difference to you. It makes a difference to me. Um, so, and I also hope you'll support me through the process because it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of work. Um, and it's, you know, going to be my life for the next four years. And it's already been my life for a year. Um, so, some of you are new um, and some of you have been, you know, been with us for a while or been with DEP for a while. Um, so, this may be old hat, but just for a refresher and I just want to go through the project area make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, so that um, you'll understand what's going on when we get to the activity later and when Eric uh, walks you through some of our design strategies. So here's the project area. Um, Jersey it's, encompasses all of Hoboken, and, and as many of you know, it um, uh, includes the south portion of Weehawken and just the very north part of Jersey City. And really, if you look at the, 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 the whole um, point of what we're doing, it's all tied to the topography. So as many of you know, the high point, which is in red um, in, in, um, in this, on this slide, is, this, is Stevens Institute. So that's the high point. It's a naturally occurring high point um, in Hoboken. And then unlike a lot of other you know, um, uh, communities along the waterfront, it actually slopes back towards the Palisades. So the back part of Hoboken is the low point. And this can actually be shown to make sense if you look at the historical uh, context. So this is from 1844. You can see we've built out the shoreline some, which is, which is normal occurrence, but you can see the development on that higher um, portion of the area where the Stevens Institute is and, and even um, along the waterfront north and south of that. And then you can see it's all wetland and tidal channel um, in the back part. And so we've built upon that, but that is why the area in that, in, you know, that is why it slopes down towards the Palisades and that's why that area is um, lower. And it makes sense for today, right? So. The, the, the area that's in gray is, is not within the 100-year floodplain, and the area in blue is within the 100-year floodplain, and that's the part that floods. So it's all, you know, made sense in 1844 and makes sense today. So uh, you all know ha what happened in Sur Hurricane Sandy. It was a breach, right? So there wasn't a lot of rainfall. It was a storm surge. And what happened? The two low points along the waterfront, it came in through uh, Weehawken Cove and, and um, Long Slip and the Jersey Transit Yard, and it, where did it go? It went to the back part of Hoboken, which is the low part. So if you think about the topography, it makes sense. Um, so I just talked about you know, the purpose and need for this project, which, which may, the mayor talked about, um, is 
was not only for coastal storm surge, which is the resist portion, but also to um, handle the systemic interior flooding. So where I live is an area that has, you know, flood due to rain. I mean, the, 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 the rain that we had, I don't know, it was like three weeks ago, my, my friend was visiting and she's like, I didn't go out of your house until three o'clock because the, the road was flooded. So um, we recognize that that, that is, um, you know, one of the issues that this project originally was going to address. Um, but as Dennis mentioned, it's kind of now been split into two phases. So in this slide, you know, originally it was a comprehensive water management strategy. And we're all still focused on it being a comprehensive. But the funding that we've been and DEP has been given is just to focus on the resist um, portion of the project. But you can see in, in green all of the D, what we call the DSD projects. Those are being moved forward by Hoboken. So many of you know this, the portion of the Southwest Park has already been built. Um, the Northwest Resili Resiliency Park, they're in full design mode. So if you have any questions about the, the green on this map, as, again, please go talk to Jen. But what we're gonna focus on tonight is the resist components. So there's, there's kind of two main things that we're working on. Um, the resist in the north and the resist in the south. And if you remember where the high point is, you'll see they kind of connect, right? So there's the high point at Stevens, and then the resist connects to the high point in Weehawken and then connects back to the high point in Jersey City. So it's basically creating a high point around, um, around the project area. And then you'll see in yellow, we call that the high level storm sewer system. So that is where we're separating the, um, the, you know, the collection of storm water on the wet side of the wall because it's going to be um, cut off from the stormwater on the dry side of the wall. So I've just explained to you, you know, how the history made this project how it is and, um, and kind of where, where, what we're doing. Um, but I also wanted to mention what we're actually currently doing now because you may be like, you know, we haven't heard a lot about Rebuild by Design. Are they actually doing any work? Well, yes, we are. Um, we've been focused on field investigations, and um, all of this information is going to feed into the design, and our engineers are um, anxiously awaiting the data. Um, so we're working on survey, both topographic, which is dry land contour mapping, and then we're working on bathymetry, which is um, un underwater contour mapping along the waterfront. And this information is really important both to our design engineers, but also to our coastal modeling team, because it's the data they feed into the model. And we also supplement for the coastal modelers with um, LIDAR, which, you know, if there's any kind of um, more detailed information they need, they can get that from the LIDAR model. Um, and then you, some of you may seen, has anyone seen the drillers out and about? Yep, a few of you. <laughs> um, so um, we've, we've been doing some subsurface investigations. Um, we've been doing more in the north and the south is, is going to um, kind of be our next uh, location. But um, so we're, we're doing um, geotechnical and environmental sampling, um, which again, the basis of a lot of our de, um, design, uh, especially for the structural part. And then starting soon, probably May, June, um, we'll do pile load testing. And that's when we actually, we have three different areas. We'll actually bring um, pile drivers out um, into Hoboken, Jersey City, Weehawken, and um, test, uh, you know, drive the piles, actually test different loads. And that will help our engineers determine the diameters and the lengths of the piles that will support the structure. You know, you saw all the wetlands that Hoboken used to be, all of that's been filled. So most of the structures in an area like this need to be supported on piles. You guys have all probably seen pile driving with all of the new, and heard it, with all of the new, um, with all of the new uh, development that's been going on. Um, so just to give you some more detail on the subservice investigation work, so obviously it's gonna follow our resist alignment. So um, you can see we're doing four different types of, of um, subsurface investigation. So the orange dots are the, uh, just the typical, um, geotech or typical borings where we take the geotechnical and the environmental samples and we're about halfway done. We've done most of the ones in the north. Um, and then we're also doing permeability tests to understand how the water flows um, in, you know, in the subsurface, which can impact the structural design um, underneath the ground, the foundations for the structure. We're also doing what we call CPT testing 
It's basically a more detailed version of the um, standard borings that can give us some more geotechnical information and, and the stratig stratigraphy, I always get that word wrong, um, of, the, of the subsurface. And then we're also going to be doing some pump tests. Those are really important for during construction because you need to dewater. Um, the groundwater is pretty high here. You need to dewater when you're doing construction work. So that just lets us know what the conditions are going to be when we're constructing. <clears throat> So um, I'm going to bring Eric um, Olson now on. He's our lead for landscape architecture, urban design. And he's going to talk to you about how this information feeds into the design. And then he's going to talk to you about the good stuff, the design criteria, and then um, the uh, engagement uh, strategies that we're going to be using moving forward to get more information from you all. Thanks, Karen. So uh, it's good to see all of you here. We're excited to be here tonight. Um, and as Karen mentioned, I'd like to just talk a little bit about um, you know, what's, what's up next. She talked a lot about what's been going on with the project, the history, some of the field investigation work that's been going on. And we're going to transition in the presentation now to talking a little bit about, OK, where does all of that information get us? It leads us into the design development process, right? That's the fun part of this project that we're going to get into, talking about taking the items that were developed in the feasibility study level work and developing those into actual designs, taking them off paper and putting them into your communities, in the streets, in the topography, and understanding what those design interventions are really like. Um, and, and one important piece of that is um, understanding this flood alignment system. And you'll hear me call it throughout the process a system, a flood risk reduction system. And the reason that I talk about it as a system is that it's not a singular item, right? It has multiple uses. Um, and it's also not one element. There's multiple elements that are making up this system from um, embankments to, to floodgates to, um, you know, subsurface sheeting um, to different types of uh, piles and foundations for the structure itself, as well as all of the urban amenities that are going to be integrated with this system, the, you know, the, the, the items that you'll be seeing in your community and the, and the new redesign of Cove Park as well. Um, so that's why I talk about it as a system. But one thing that's critical for this system is identifying sort of what I'm going to call the spine of the project, which is what you see here in, in the, the magenta, the pink line. Um, and the spine of the project is really important just like the spine of your body is very important in that the rest of this system all sort of functions based on the function of that spine. We need to make sure that we're getting it right um, so that all of the other multi-purpose elements that are a part of this flood risk reduction system um, along the alignment are tied to a spine that is in the right place and is, is is, you know, is what it needs to be. Um, and something that's feeding into that is all of the field investigation work, some of the coastal modeling that Karen mentioned. That is why we've been concentrating on that level of work up until this point, to make sure that we can get towards validating that spine and ensuring that it's correct, so that when we begin to have the discussions about the other elements, the urban amenities and the park, that we, we know that we've got the spine locked down. Um, so the, the sort of investigations and modeling is an important part of that, but the other critical part of that is, is you, the community, and your input in the process. Um, you know, once we have validated the alignment of this, the spine of the, of the system, you know, we'll be coming back to talk with you about what those findings are and what those validation is. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, we're going to use the opportunity tonight to talk about some of the other items, the urban, urban design elements, the urban amenities, um, and, and sort of get in the activity later, we're going to be getting some of your, your feeling on some of those, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the design development process, what that means. Again, this is taking sort of the concepts from the feasibility phase of work and moving them into the, the actual design portion. Um, and there are some critical inputs into this design development project process that we're going to be uh, needing moving forward. And one of those that we just discussed is the field investigations, uh, which are, are critical. 
Um, another important input is uh, a series of design principles, and this is something that we as a design team at AECOM have identified as sort of a, a product, if you will, of the prior phases of work, the feasibility study, the environmental impact statement, and all of the input that was provided by the community during those phases of work. Um, so, so what are those design principles? Um, there's sort of two types. One is the sort of the, the engineering design principles, which is sort of the uh, what is required from structurally of this flood risk reduction uh, system. And integrated with that are the sort of landscape architecture and urban design uh, principles. These are, you know, these are the items that you're going to be seeing in your community every day, right? They're not the stuff that's underground, but it's what we're actually going to be working with you to integrate into your existing community's context. Um, and so we've sort of identified three principles that are going to help guide the work as we start stepping into this design pro development process. Uh, the first one is that uh, this flood risk reduction system is multi-purpose, which I talked a little bit about. With, what does that mean? It's not only providing us a flood risk reduction benefit, but it's also providing other public benefits so that whatever this system is in its final form has multi-purpose built into it, has more than one function integrated with it. Um, the second principle is that whatever that um, flood risk reduction system multi-purposed out becomes that that is integrated into your existing urban fabric that is sort of seamlessly becomes a, a part of the communities that you're already living in. Um, you see a couple of renderings here that have been pulled from the feasibility study level of work that started to get at that idea, but this is kind of the time when we're going to take this concept and really talk with you about what does that mean for all of you? What would you like to see in these design interventions and how, how can we make sure that it is actually woven into uh, you know, the places that you already live? and work. Uh, and then the last design principle is somewhat similar, but it's kind of specifically focused on, on open space improvements, and that is kind of specifically thinking about uh, the redesign of the Cove Park area in, in Weehawken Cove. And that's what's important about this design principle for the design team is that whatever the alignment system needs to be in this area based on the validation process that we're continuing to, to go through, that it's not going to inhibit the ability of this open space park to be just that, to be a park. So, you know, we want it on an everyday basis for everyone in this community to, to be a park when you're there on, a, uh, on an everyday basis. We don't want you to be thinking about some of the other function. We want you to be able to utilize it as a park. But inherently, it will also have built into it this flood risk reduction component um, that will function in the event that it's, it's required. Um, and so, Moving back to talking a little bit about the design development process, we have those two inputs which are critical, and the third, of course, is input from all of you at multiple phases as we move through this process. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, in just a minute, but hopefully with all of these three inputs into the design development process, it will lead to you know, a final design being delivered for the project and ultimately to the construction and completion of the project. So let's jump into talking a little bit about um, the community engagement strategy that we've set up and the schedule for those events. So we have um, the design team at AECOM along with, um, you know, collaboration with uh, NJDEP has, has worked up um, a, a schedule and a different strategies for the, for the engagement for this project. Um, there are three different types of meetings that will be happening over the course of the coming months. Um, so the, the first one, uh, first type of meetings are the public meetings. That's where we all are tonight at the introductory public meeting. Um, these are going to be a time where we can get together with all of you and kind of focus on the project as a whole, north, south, all of the topics in between. Um, they'll provide us an opportunity to update you all on the progress of the project, the progress of the design process, and how we have um, been, you know, taking the feedback we've been getting from you and, and feedbacking that into our design process as well. Um, Mayor Bala did discuss this, the citizen advisory groups briefly, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we will also be meeting with them on a, on a regular basis as well um, to, to have some of those discussions that Mayor Bala touched on earlier. And then also the last one, and I think the design team is really excited about this one, is, is um, a series of design zone workshops. Um, and these are going to be the opportunity for us to kind of like 
take the, the ideas and the topics of this project and really focus on kind of the specific ones, get into the nitty gritty discussions with you all about the design and the design interventions. Um, and they'll be happening at three separate points along the process um, in these different rounds of workshops, if you will. They'll happen to be about four to five workshops per round uh, for a total of about 15. They'll happen at critical junctures along the process. I should have mentioned earlier that all of the meetings have been set up in a way so that they are not only aligned to when we, uh, you know, how they feed back to each other between meeting to meeting and, and the input we're getting from you, but they're also um, inherently tied to the project milestones that are coming up to make sure that whatever project milestones we have as a design team, that the input that we're receiving at all these meetings and the engagement is, is feedbacking into those milestones at the correct time. So quickly on the design zone workshops, um, you, you may be familiar uh, with these from previous phases of work because they have been pulled forward, but for anybody who's new, um, the alignment as a whole has been sort of, uh, the design team has split it into three design zones. Um, the first design zone, design zone one in the north is kind of in the Weehawken tie-in area. Uh, design zone two encompasses the Cove Park area and the area right along Weehawken Cove there. Um, design zone three covers um, Washington Street, the alleyway, and, and, and a portion of Garden Street as it goes to hit Cove Park. And then in the southern zone we have design zone four, which kind of covers the, the observer highway and the New Jersey transit area, and then the fifth design zone on the southwestern portion of the project, which is the Jersey City tie-in. Um, and so the way that the design zone workshops are going to function is that uh, we are going to hold one workshop per design zone. So for example, there will be in the first round of design zone workshops, which will be happening the end of this month and early in June, we'll be having a workshop in design zone one. We'll be having a workshop or with uh, focusing on design zone one, focusing on design zone two, focusing on design zone three. Of course, there might be some topics that overlap, um, but, but those will provide an opportunity for us to talk about, okay, what is happening in design zone three from a design perspective um, from your community and what's happening in design zone two because we as a design team know that, you know, what happens in Design Zone 3 along Washington Street doesn't necessarily want to be the same thing that's happening in Design Zone 2 in the park. Um, and, and we think that these Design Zone workshops will provide a great opportunity for us to have those more focused discussions and get input on those focused items. And then in these larger public meetings, we'll be able to kind of report back and discuss what, was, what came out of those workshops. So um, again, this is just kind of an overview of the schedule. Um, we have uh, the meeting tonight. As I mentioned, those first round of designs on workshops is going to be coming up the end of this month and in early June. Um, keep an eye peeled for, for more information on DEP's website about those. Um, and then uh, after all that, we'll be meeting with the citizen advisory group again. Um, one thing that I didn't mention earlier about the CAG meetings is that they've been set up in a way so that um, the design team is meeting with the CAG before and after these type of events. So that's on purpose, one, so that we can talk with the CAG about, okay, these are the items that we're planning to focus on in the, in the upcoming meetings and events. These are how we're planning to have uh, those items um, sort of feed back into our design process because we want to ensure that we're using our time wisely and that we're, we're covering the right topics. So they'll help us do that. And then additionally, after we have meetings like tonight, we'll report back to the CAG. We'll say, this is what we heard. This is what input was provided. These are the interactions we had with everyone that was at the event. And this is how that information is going to start feedbacking into the design process. Um, so with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about an, some engagement that we have planned for tonight. Um, and we, uh, as a design team, team, we know that we are a new design team. AECOM is a new design team on this project. But we do understand that there was a good amount of work that was done in the prior phases. For example, you see some of the toolkit items up on the screen here. Um, and although tonight's activity is not going to focus explicitly on the toolkit items, it's going to be a little bit more high level in focus. Um, we just want you to know that we do know about all of this work and we're going to be talking a little bit more about these specific items in the designs and workshop. Um, the goal of the engagement tonight is to, um, one, for us to start to build some relationships with all of you in this room. You know, I, I have not met all of you yet. I'm looking forward to meeting you, to hearing what you like about your communities, hearing what your preferences for the different types of spaces in your communities are. Um, so that's, that's one goal of the activity tonight. Um, another goal is that we'll be able to um, validate and reaffirm some of the input that was provided in prior phases of work. Um, I know there are some new faces in the crowd tonight that haven't been to a meeting before. A, a number of you have 
been involved throughout the process and provided input at prior meetings in the past, but we realize that it's been a little while since we had uh, um, since there was a meeting for the project. It's been a little while since that input was received, and there have been a few developments since then. So, one, we want to validate that input, see if your input is, is the same as it was then. Um, you know, specifically in the activity, there are some items that uh, we have read and been informed of input that you've given, and um, we understand how you, uh, the community has provided input on those in the past, but we just want to ensure that's still the same way and give anybody who's new in the crowd an opportunity to do that. The other thing that tonight's activity is going to do is once we kind of gather that information, it's going to give the design team a little bit better idea about how we can focus what we're planning to um, do with all of you in the design zone workshops in a more um, strategic way to make sure that, we're, again, we're using our time effectively and that we're focusing on the right thing. So if tonight feels like it's a little bit of a step back, it might be a half step up just kind of looking at the project as a whole again to reaffirm where we are as the first step in this design process. And then it's gonna be helping us to really have great discussions in the Design Zone workshops and, and coming public meetings after this. So um, the activity itself, when you came in tonight, uh, you were handed a, a, a number of stickers. If you didn't receive some, let us know. Uh, we'll get you some. Uh, there were three different colors of stickers. You were asked to identify, do you primarily live, work, or visit here? Um, the different colors of stickers don't uh, correlate to any difference in the input. It's just a way for us as a design team to understand who you are when you're placing your input in the activity. But for example, a red sticker is not worth more than a yellow sticker. They're all equal votes. Okay, so that's uh, critical. Um, so the activity itself, um, the design team has identified five different types of urban spaces that already exist in your community along the route of this alignment system. And what we want to do is sort of get your input on these types of spaces. So one of them is the alleyway that's in design zone three. Another type of space that we're going to be talking about is the sidewalks in your community, and those happen um, in design zones three along Washington Street and Garden Street, um, and design zone four along Washington Street as well. Um, Cove Park is a, is, a, is a different type of space that we'll be wanting to, to talk with you a little bit about, as well as an urban street condition. This is kind of where, um, you know, thinking about observer highway and traffic is a little bit higher down there, so it might have some different implications. And then finally, the uh, type of space is a green corridor, which happens both sort of in the, the northern and the southern parts of the project. And for each of these types of urban spaces, there will be one station per space type. Uh, for each type, we will be sort of asking you a series of questions. And it's what the questions are trying to get at is what do you like? Um, what are your preferences on the quality of the design interventions that will be happening in this space? Um, so, for example, how should it look? Getting at the materiality or the aesthetics of the space. Does it want to be a vibrant place that stands out and that you really see, or does it want to be somewhat more subdued? Um, what should it be? Does it want to be a destination, a place I go to uh, for a particular reason or with, with a particular people that I know or that I want to meet there? Or is it just kind of more of a pass-through place that I enjoy on a more passive level? Um, or how does it feel? Is it a social space where I gather with other people? Or is it more of a personal space where I'm just kind of there by myself or close family members? Um, and that kind of is going to help the design team eke out a little bit of like what types of scale of spaces are we looking for here? Um, again, we understand that some of these questions you've probably provided input on on some level before, but we just want to reaffirm that and begin to, to have those discussions with you to make sure that we're all on the right page moving forward. Um, so the activity is set up on the other half of the room over here. Um, as I mentioned, each urban space type will have a table with an easel. Um, there will be uh, both AECOM and DEP staff at each of the tables if you have questions about the particular activity or any of the items that you're seeing. Um, the, the poster boards that are taped to the tabletops are where we would like you to place your stickers, which is sort of your vote on your preference based on the comparison that is on that board. Um, and again, let us know if you have any questions. Um, I think that we are going to break out. I, I got it. Yeah, so I think we're going to break out for the activity. Before we do that, I do want to bring up this slide um, that just kind of like highlights some of the next steps for the prog process. Um, 
again, the design's on workshops end of May and early June. Um, there's also some information about the DEP website and email address up there for you to um, jot down if you would like. We'll leave this slide up throughout the, this, the course of the activity. So I think with that, we're going to break out and head over to the activity. One thing that I do want to mention is that we would ask that you spend some time at each of the stations. Don't focus all of your time on one. We would like to get your input on all of the different types of spaces that we've uh, identified. And um, So spend some time at one station, move to the next, and so on. Um, and uh, we look forward to chatting with you. Thanks. Good evening, folks. Uh, we don't want to interrupt all the interaction that's going on. We just want to wish everybody a great night. Thank you for coming out. Uh, be sure to keep a... Uh, uh, a lookout for some of the upcoming uh, design workshops that are happening between the end of May and the beginning of June. There's going to be plenty of opportunities for you to be involved. Thank you for coming out, and we're yielding the uh, rest of the time back to you. Thank you. <laughs>